Good afternoon. My name is Steve Wang, Vice President and Team Leader of the Logistics Pricing Team at Samsung SDS. I'm very pleased to provide the retrospect and prospect for the global economy and logistics market trend for the first half and the remaining half of the year. During this webinar, we will present to you the global economic outlook, key issues and trends, and the ocean and air market outlook for 2023. Now, moving on, let me introduce the guest speaker who will give his presentation for global economic trends today. Good afternoon. I'm So Jung Lee, an associate professor in the Department of Economics at Seoul National University. Nice to meet you, Professor Lee. Let's talk about global economics and logistics market conditions in detail. Okay, um, today I want to talk about why central bank meetings and interest rate announcements are actually pretty interesting. Analyzing stuff like US-China trade tensions or the Russia-Ukraine war may seem more exciting, but there is a good reason to pay attention to central bank announcements too. The Federal Reserve Board, FLB, and the European Central Bank, ECB, released some valuable information in their addresses um, and announcements after these meetings. It's not just about interest rates, but they give us insight into the economic outlook and, and other important details. First, let me briefly explain global economic trends in the first half of 2023. Now, let's dig into what happened in June 2023 regarding monetary policy decisions in the US and Europe. So in the FOMC minutes released on June 14th, the Federal Reserve decided to keep the federal funds rate, which is the policy interest rate, at the same level of 5 to 5.25%. On the other hand, the European Central Bank raised three key interest rates, like the repo rate and the marginal lending rate, which are the rates banks pay um, when they borrow funds from the ECB, and the deposit rate that banks receive when they deposit their funds at the ECB. Um, they bumped those up by 25 basis points to 4%, 4.25%, and 3.5% um, respectively. At first glance, it might seem like the US and Europe are going in different directions with their monetary policies. But if you look closer, um, you will see that both the FLB and ECB are actually pretty concerned about the current level of inflation and are being cautious given the uncertain economic situation. You might be wondering why central banks are hesitant to quickly lower interest rates um, to boost the economy, especially from the perspective of stock market investors or businesses planning um, big investments. Well, the main reason is that high inflation can seriously mess up the economy, and once it's high, bringing it down becomes a real challenge. So central banks try to avoid slashing interest rate too hastily uh, because that can actually lead to inflation coming back stronger, uh, which would require um, even more rate increase. It's kind of like um, taking a fever reducer when you have a um, high temperature. If the fever persists, it can have serious consequences, so you need to use the fever reducer the right way. But if you get the timing or dosage wrong, it can have negative effects too. So central banks raise interest rates for a few main reasons. First, when they raise the benchmark interest rate, um, it indirectly increases the interest rates on bank loans and deposits, making it more expensive for companies to borrow money and reducing their investment. It also makes loans for households more expensive, um, which can um, dampen um, consumption. Lastly, higher deposit interest rates encourage high households and businesses to stash their cash in deposits, so there is less money circulating in the economy, which leads to um, reduced investment, uh, employment, and consumption, ultimately bringing down um, inflation. Now let's talk about the connection between interest rates and the stock market. Generally, when interest rates go up, stock prices tend to go down. According to economic theory, a company's stock price is basically the present value of its future earnings. So if interest rates are high, the discount rate for those future earnings goes up, 
which means the present value of the company drops and stock prices decline. But here's the twist. In reality, we often see stock prices shoot up right after the FRB or ECB announces an interest rate hike. Some people say, well, this contradicts economic theories and claim that economics is too theoretical and not that useful in the real world. But recent economic research has actually come up with um, theories to explain this. Um, the thing is, when the FRB and ECB announce interest rate decisions, they also provide their assessment of the current economic situation in, uh, in the statements or minutes. These central banks have tons of information that regular market participants don't. So based on all that information, they make a comprehensive evaluation uh, of the economy. The minutes gives us um, insights into their assessments um, that regular investors might not pick up on, and even clues about future monetary policies. So even when um, they announce rate hikes, um, if other economic indicators point in a positive direction, stock prices can still rise. Now let's check out how the FRB saw the economic situation in the minutes um, just released in June. They said both um, businesses and households are doing pretty well um, with economic activities expanding steadily and the number of jobs continuing to grow. That's why they actually revised their economic growth rate uh, forecasts um, upward compared to the March announcement, um, projecting growth rates of 1% in 2023, 1.1% in 2024, and 1.8% uh, in 2025. The unemployment rate is at a low level of around 4%, which is considered ideal for a healthy economy. Keep in mind that this figure includes temporary unemployment due to job changes and seasonal factors. Even in good times, it's unrealistic to expect a 0% unemployment rate. So the, the economists call it uh, the natural unemployment rate, um, and with the current rate around 4%, it's pretty favorable. But low unemployment rates also bring um, the risk of inflation from wage pressures in a labor market where job seekers have the upper hand. Now let's talk inflation. It's still hanging out at a high level. The forecast for the core inflation, which excludes volatile items like fruits, vegetables, and energy products with big price swings, is expected to hit 3.9% um, this year. Central banks, including the Bank of Korea, um, FRB, and ECB, have set their inflation target at 2%. So they've been stressing the high chance of future rate um, hikes to get the target um, in check. So long story short, um, even though the FRB didn't change the benchmark interest rate, um, the minutes show they are pretty concerned about the current level of inflation and they are being cautious given the uncertain um, economic situation. In the Eurozone, um, the message is even clearer. According to the ECB's June statement, um, the Eurozone has been seeing um, the steady economic growth, but inflation is expected to stay high for a while. They are projecting the core inflation rate of 5.1% this year, way above um, the ECB's 2% target. ECB President Lagarde um, even mentioned the possibility of more interest rate hikes um, to reach that 2% target. So while the ECB bumped up the benchmark interest rates by 25 basis points, which means 0.25%, um, they believe the current economic situation can handle it and might even have more hikes in the pipeline if needed. Okay, um, let's quickly touch on the global economic outlook for the second half of this year and next year based on what we learned from the FRB and ECB minutes. The June statements and minutes from the FRB and ECB show that both central banks are pretty positive about economic activity. By looking at the minutes along with the interest rate decisions, we can understand how they evaluate the current economic conditions and what they expect expect in the future. It's important to separate this info because the central bank's assessment of the economy 
and their outlook can have um, different effects on various economic factors. So just relying on the benchmark interest rate, whether it's going up or down um, alone, won't give you the full picture of making accurate economic forecasts. There's a very nice academic paper published in the American Economic Journal, Macroeconomics, in 2020 by um, ECB economists Marek Jarosinski and Peter Karate. So these economists used advanced statistical techniques to break down the information contained in the minutes. The information about the benchmark interest rate versus the information about the economic condition and future prospect. Their analysis sheds some light on how each piece of information affects different economic factors. Let's start with the effects of a benchmark interest rate hike. Um, according to their paper, when they raise it by 25 basis points, their model predicts that stock prices drop by about 5%, access bond premium go up by um, 25 basis points, and GDP and price levels um, go down by um, 50 basis points and 25 basis points, respectively. All that movement in the economic indicators can be explained by the usual economic theories, so nothing's really surprising here. Now, a positive evaluation of the economic situation in the central bank minutes has a totally different effects on various economic factors. When there is a good news on the economy, interest rates go up and tends to stay up for a while. Um, stock prices go up by about 1 to 2 percent, excess bond premium dip a bit, um, GDP and price levels both go up, and the price level gets a boost of uh, around 0.1 percent and takes about three years to go back to its previous level. So what can we learn from these results? Recall that both the FRB and ECB are very optimistic um, about the economic condition. Based on what those ECB economists found, it's likely that both the central banks will keep the benchmark interest rates high for quite some time to reach their inflation targets because the inflation caused by good economic conditions does not go back to its original level quickly. So lots of economists and analysts are already doing comprehensive evaluations of central bank um, statements and minutes. But sometimes those analyses can be subjective or people just repeat the contents without independent judgment. Luckily, um, the FRB and ECB provide various materials like minutes and analytical reports, which give us valuable insights um, into the central bank stance and future outlook. These days, the economists even use machine learning um, techniques based on um, text analysis to squeeze out as much information as possible uh, from these uh, you know, the central bank announcements like FOMC meetings and ECB statements to gauge how concerned or optimistic the central banks are about the current economic situation and the future. Let's wrap it up by briefly talking about the future economic outlook presented in the um, June FOMC minutes. But before that, here's a quick intro um, to the Federal Reserve System, also known as the Fed. The Fed um, is operated by the Federal Reserve Board, um, FRB, composed of seven board members who, along with five presidents from regional um, Federal Reserve Banks, form um, the Federal Open Market Committee, which we call um, FOMC. So this committee is responsible for determining um, U.S. monetary policy. Now that we've, um, we have this, this figure, um, the horizontal axis shows the years 2023, 2024, 2025, and the longer term. And the vertical axis represents at the benchmark interest rate. Um, now you can see those blue dots. So each dot, so these dots represent um, the FOMC members' best guesses for the future benchmark interest rates. For example, most of them expect a rate of 5.5% or higher in 2023. And for 2024, they think it'll ho hover around um, the 4% range. In 2025, estimates get um, a bit more scattered ranging from 2% um, to the 5% range. 
But in the long term, um, they are aiming for a benchmark interest rate of around 2.5% to hit that 2% um, inflation target of the central bank. And now for the second figure, um, it shows the FOMC members outlook for real GDP growth rate, unemployment rate, and core inflation. The horizontal axis covers the period from 20, um, 2018 to 2025 and beyond, while the vertical axis shows percentages. That blue line represents um, the actual values from 2018 and from 2023 uh, onward, it shows the distribution and median of what the FOMC members expect if things go as planned with monetary and financial policies. The growth rate is projected to keep climbing and reach uh, um, around 2% in 2025. The unemployment rate is expected to stabilize at around 4 to 5% with no further decline. As for core inflation, they reckon it'll hit that 2% target by 2025 if the Fed follows the projected benchmark interest rate. Today's presentation provided an overview of the significance of central bank meetings and interest rate announcements, as well as their economic implications. We have explored um, the evaluations of the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank and how they affect different economic indicators. By closely examining um, central bank minutes and statements, we can gain valuable insights into the current economic conditions and future monetary policies. Thank you for listening. Next is the global economic and logistic trends for the first half and the outlook for the second half of 2023. On the agenda, we will reflect the ocean and air market conditions of the first half of 2023 Thereafter, a discussion of the key issues and trends, and finish with the outlook of the ocean and air market for the remainder of the year. Let me first explain about the SCFI, the Index of Global Ocean Freight Rates. The SCFI index reflects the spot rates of the Shanghai Export Container Transport Market. Generally, the break-even point is around 1,000 mark. Looking at before and after the pandemic, the SCFI Composite Index increased from 2021 to the first half of 2022 and it is now stabilizing after a clear decline. Compared to the average value in January 2022, the historic peak, the average value in June 2023, is a decline of about 81%. But when you compare the average values of the composite index, it was 811 in 2019, 1265 in 2020, 3792 in 2021, 3410 in 2022, and currently 976 in the first half of 2023 higher than that of 2019 before the pandemic. However, it is just slightly higher and it's still hovering in the three digits. Looking at the details of the latest freight rate trends, ocean carriers implemented GRIs or general rate increases to protect against further decline in rates, but the effects were small due to the imbalance of supply and demand. Also, carriers levied surcharges because of the Panama Canal Authority's imposed debt restrictions due to the drought. However, the rates closed lower as the demand failed to support them. Moreover, the ILWU and the PMA reached an agreement on the US West Coast in June of this year, which has been an issue since the first half of 2022. However, if the cargo volume that moved from the West Coast to the East Coast during the negotiation period does not recover as expected, it can become a factor in the downturn of rates in the future because of the real supply growth of the US West Coast. To sum up, Container ocean freight rates in the first half of 2023 can be summarized as freight rate normalization to the pre-pandemic. Next, we will take a look at the trends of ocean supply and demand. First is the ocean demand look through the lens of the global container cargo volume. Following the rates, let's look at the movement of global ocean container cargo volume. You can easily recognize the flow of cargo volume per continent based on the arrows. The percentage in the parentheses shows the increase and decrease of cargo volume in 2023 compared to that of 2022. The eye-catching part is that in the east-west trades, the cargo volume of the Asia to Europe route is 16.6 million TEUs in 2023, up a whopping 7.9% year-on-year. Container demand recovery to Europe is very positive. 
However, the cargo volumes to the Asia to North America route and Europe to North America route are expected to decrease by a massive 7% and 6.4% respectively, compared to those of 2022. This could be because of the demand recession in North America after a sudden rise in the interest rates in the USA. Nevertheless, the intra-Asia cargo volume is expected to support the increase of container cargo volume overall, as it was 63.8 million TEUs, of 1.2% compared to that of last year. Let's move on to the supply side of containers. During two of our webinars in 2022, we looked at the increase in container freight rates and U.S. supply chain disruptions caused by congestions in port facilities, which led to the shortage of shipments. Adding to that, let me explain the, the level of the supply chain in the first half of this year. The graph on the left shows the global status of vessel dwell time in ports. The bar graph refers to the capacity of staying vessels in ports, and their unit is in 1 million TEUs. The bar graph refers to the amount excluding the sailing capacity from the global container capacity. In short, it shows the shipping capacities staying at the port. In July 2022, when port congestions were severe, 9.4 million TEUs of shipping capacity were stuck in ports, but it has now stabilized. Considering the fact that the capacity of dwelling vessels is still high, compared to that of 2019, it looks like the operation risks, including global port strikes, are not completely resolved yet. The graph on the right shows the average vessel speed of container ships. When the market is declining, carriers reduce vessel speed and slow steam to protect the freight rates. Following the reduction of the vessel speed, carriers can reduce fuel cost and protect freight rates as the available shipping capacity decreases in the market. The average vessel speed in September 2021 was 14.5 knots, and now it's reduced considerably more to a 13.9 knots. You can easily understand the strategy of carriers responding to the declining market with vessel speed. A blank sailing refers to the cancellation of the sailing schedule of cargo vessels. Don't believe that the cause of blank sailings only occur when there are delays caused by severe weather conditions, strikes, or when terminals are shut down. Carriers came up with this strategy of blank sailing to protect the freight rates in the first half. Simply put, a blank sailing sa means temporarily not sailing a certain route or canceling a port call because of a demand decrease or sailing schedule adjustment. The above graph shows the trend of blank sailings from the, the major east-west routes. In more detail, you can see the number of canceled sailings from Asia to East Coast North America, West Coast North America, North Europe, and the Mediterranean. If you look at the graph, you know that there are frequent blank sailings from 2022 to early 2023. The reason for massive blank sailings in 2022 was because of operational needs, including the need to ease port congestion. On the other hand, it is a little bit different this year. It is to protect the spot rates. Looking at the numbers, there were only 39 blank sailings in the first quarter of 2021, when the rates were on the rise. Blank sailings then increased 51 times in the second half of 2021, 96 times in the first half of 2022, and 106 times in the second half of 2022. Particularly, carriers actively managed supply by selecting a very high level of blank sailings, 109 times on the average until the first quarter of this year. However, as demand expectations gradually increase due to factors including inventory adjustment and expectations over the economy in the second half, blank sailings are gradually normalizing. The average number in the second quarter of this year was 52 times, a 52% decrease from the first quarter. Moreover, blank sailings on the west coast of North America, which was particularly severe, peaked at 62 times in February and plummeted to just 29 times in June. This marks the end of the protecting strategy of freight rates, which have been maintained by blank sailings on the west coast of North America. At the same time, it reflects expectations over demand recovery and rebound of freight rates in the future. We have looked at ocean cargo market conditions until now. Next, we will take a look at the data on air cargo market conditions. First, let's look at the TAC index, the freight rate index of air cargo released by Hong Kong Weekly. If you look at the graph, freight rates from Hong Kong to the USA and Europe rallied slightly from time to time after May 2022, but overall it shows a downward trend. The monthly average has been declining for three consecutive months for the Hong Kong to the USA route, and declining for 10 consecutive months for the Hong Kong to Europe lane until June. 
Compared to its peak in 2021, Hong Kong to USA shows a 68% drop from $14.80 per kilogram to $4.70 per kilogram in the last week of June. Hong Kong to Europe dropped by 56% from $8.50 to $3.70 per kilogram. Also, even though it is not shown here, the rates of another representative route from Shanghai show a similar trend. But compared to pre-pandemic levels of 2019, the rates are still higher. The bar graph on the left shows a CTK, or cargo ton kilometer, of air freight counted by IATA. It is a representative indicator of demand. If you look at the graph, the total air demand of international flights worldwide in April 2023 was 65 million ton kilometers, about 93% compared to that of 2019, and about 89% compared to that of the previous year. Similar to the container market, the year-on-year -year decrease is because of weak demand followed by the continuous global economic slowdown. Next, let's move on to the cargo demand of major Asian countries on the right, counted by Seabury. First, the air freight market in Asia also showed a weak trend because of the global economic slowdown. Particularly, the Asian market with many manufacturing factories was heavily influenced and decreased greatly, showing a 17% decrease compared to the global market. By major country, China showed a 13% drop, Korea 21, Hong Kong 20, and Vietnam 27% respectively, year on year. If you look at the supply based on the IATA data, first, the left graph shows the international air freight supply worldwide in ACTK from January 2019 to April 2023. If you look at the graph, unlike the demand, the supply was the lowest in 2020 during the pandemic and continuously increased every year. The supply thus fell by about 82% compared to those of 2020 and 2019, increased up to about 95% currently in 2023. Let's move on to the status of cargo supply per aircraft type with the graph on the right. First, what needs close observation is that the passenger value supply that decreased to 30% in 2020 recovered to 49% in the first quarter of 2023. Next, the overall cargo supply declined from 2020, but not only the proportion, but also the absolute value of freighter supply is higher compared to that of 2019. This trend is likely to continue in 2023. Last but not least, freighters, passenger aircraft converted for cargo purposes, which accounted for 13% in 2021, mostly disappeared from the market in 2023. We have looked at the global logistics market conditions for the first half of 2023 until now. Before moving on to a second half outlook, let's take a look at the key issues that can impact the logistics market this year. Among the key issues in the first half of this year, we have four issues regarding the ocean market. The first issue is the end of the 2M Alliance. The breakup announcement of the 2M Alliance, which is jointly operated by MSC and Maersk, who are the first and second largest container carriers by tonnage, has attracted a lot of attention. You may wonder why this is happening. The answer is that the two major carriers have different long-term business strategies. MSC continues to grow its fleet capacity with its combined private and chartered fleet, surpassing 5 million TUs for the first time ever. In other words, while MSC is focused on traditional shipping by enhancing fleet capacity and expanding the market share, Maersk is preparing for its leap to an integrated logistics company through mergers and acquisitions including faster delivery, service competitiveness, and cost reduction. Due to the strategic differences between the two companies, after the breakup of the 2M Alliance, MSC will likely be able to provide global services on their own, while Maersk will likely maintain its current network only by partnering with other alliances or forming a new alliance. The second major issue is the full-scale action taken after the US government enacted the Revised Shipping Act, which increased the liability of foreign carriers and limited freight rate increases. OSRA 2022 came into effect last year with the signature of President Biden after 23 years. Since OSRA 2022 took effect, the Federal Maritime Commission has been given the authority to investigate demerge and detention complaints, and if found to be unjustified, the carrier must not only pay a fine, but also refund the money received. In terms of carrier responses, HMN and MSC have announced that they will not charge the merge and detention fees for periods when the terminals are closed, including weekends and holidays. 
In addition, in the event of a lawsuit between the shipper and the carrier, over freight rates, the burden of proof will be on the carrier, not the shipper. This is expected to have a positive impact on U.S. exports and manufacturing businesses. However, due to the ban on unreasonable shipping restrictions, there is a possibility that carriers may increase freight rates on the backhaul routes between North America and Asia to preserve profitability. The third issue is the agreement reached between the ILWU and the PMA on the U.S. West Coast. The union management contract for ports in the western U.S. expired on July 1st of last year. But the settlement was delayed for more than a year due to protracted bargaining over a variety of issues, including partial automation, wage increases, and more. In the meantime, jurisdictional disputes between employers and labor at the Port of Seattle, as well as strikes, have continued to highlight operational issues at the West Coast, and shippers have shifted cargo from West Coast to the East. With the dispute resolved for the time being, it is likely that some cargo will return to the U.S. West Coast following the labor agreement. However, due to supply chain issues highlighted during the pandemic, the preference over the East Coast is likely to continue in order to diversify the supply chain. The concern is that if the current supply level is maintained amid the late return of cargo to the West, the supply and demand imbalance will continue to persist, which will also delay the market recovery. Last but not least, the final issue for the first half is the defense of freight rates to aggressive fleet management in a declining market. I mentioned earlier that carriers are currently managing supply by blank sailing and slow steaming. Idle fleets refer to vessels that are anchored for long periods of time without actually operating. And a whopping 3.4% of the entire fleet capacity are classified as idle fleets as of May this year. Scrapping has slowed somewhat, but it will aggressively increase in the second half easing seam of uh, supply pressure amidst these different strategies of ocean liners. Shippers will need to be fully prepared for long lead times as well. Let me now turn to some key issues in the air cargo market. The first issue is that ocean carriers started to enter the air cargo market in 2021 and have continued to expand their air business this year by capitalizing on the surge in demand during the pandemic. First of all, Maersk Air Cargo, which launched its Asia to North America service in July last year, recently introduced five out of six freighters it had ordered at the inception of the business. By doing so, the company strengthened routes between China and the US and Europe, as well as routes between Korea and the USA. Next, MSC Air Cargo, which started operations in December last year, has been operating on a smaller scale than the other ocean carriers with only one freighter. However, the company has recently shown signs of expanding its aviation business by pursuing a merger with Italian cargo carrier Alice Cargo, which owns four freighters. Finally, CMA CGM Air Cargo, which started operations in June 2021, the earliest of the three ocean carriers, has also recently implemented a long-term strategic air cargo partnership with the acquisition of a 9% stake in Air France KLM in May 2022. Through this partnership, the companies will jointly operate 12 freighters, six from CMA CGM and six from Air France KLM, and sell freighter space accordingly. The partnership will also offer Air France KLM's passenger aircraft belly capacity. The second issue is the global international passenger recovery, which is linked to air freight belly supply. According to the OAG data, in June 2023, global international passenger seats were at 90.4% of pre-pandemic June 2019 levels, with the U.S. nearly reaching pre-pandemic levels at 98.4%. However, the recovery in Asia has been slower than in the other regions, with Southeast Asia at 77.2% and China at 45.2%. As for the outlook for global international passenger seats, the OAG believes that they will continue to rise to August and recover to the pre-pandemic levels of 93%. Now that we have covered some of the key issues affecting the logistics market, the final part is probably what you would be most interested in. What will the outlook of the logistics market look like in the second half of the year? Let's take a look at the outlook for the ocean market. For the second half of this year, on a somewhat positive note, Clarkson's volume forecast for this year was initially forecasted down minus 1.6% year on year as of January but they have gradually closed the gap and finally revised their figures upwards to a positive 0.3% year on year in their latest June release. This probably reflects the expectation for pickup in demand 
in the second half due to the overall global economic recovery and normalization of retail inventories. Bloomberg and the National Retail Federation are also expecting a recovery in demand in the second half compared to the first half, as the market is entering the normal peak season. In the supply sector, market pressure from record high new vessel delivery is likely to continue. While the new vessel deliveries in 2022 were around 1 million TEUs, this year the number is expected to nearly double to 2 million TEUs. On the other hand, scrapping volumes are also increasing compared to 2022, but still only at a modest level. Supply growth is expected to increase to 6.8% year on year this year, which will limit the market conditions from rising. Furthermore, the growth in fleets centered around large size vessel is also noteworthy on the supply side. Large vessels of 7,600 TEUs and above are forecasted to increase by 9.6% in 2023, while mid-sized and small feeder vessels of 3,900 and 7,600 TEUs are expected to increase modestly at 1.3% and 3.2% in 2023, respectively. Supply focusing on bulk carriers is expected to be deployed on the ocean routes, including the US and Europe, which are likely to see additional supply amid slowing decline in US demand. Large vessels previously deployed on an existing ocean routes are expected to be transferred to other routes, which will continue to add pressure on the overall capacity. Then let's take a look at the question everyone wants to know. What will happen to ocean freight rates in the second half? The figure above shows a graph of demand divided by supply. With an index above 100, which is the break-even point, a reading above 100 indicates that demand exceeds supply, while the reading below 100 indicates excess supply. Looking at the outlook for the supply demand index, Jewelry believes that excess supply would persist for some time due to large vessel deliveries. Since a combination of factors other than supply and demand affect freight rates, a low supply demand index should not be taken as a sign of weakness in freight rates. This is because a number of unpredictable factors, such as Evergreen's vessel blocking the Suez Canal or port congestion can limit supply and change the market dynamics. However, it is important to look at the underlying supply demand sector when looking at the market outlook. BIMCO, or the Baltic International Maritime Organization, recently warned of an economic slowdown following the US interest rate heights in 2023 and believes that certain uncertainty will remain. However, the recovery of volumes started to improve in the second half of the year. The organization is optimistic that the supply demand index will be more or less balanced in 2024. Let's go to the outlook for the air cargo market in the second half. The table on the left shows the yearly air cargo demand and growth compiled by AIDA. The cargo demand reached its peak in 2021, then fell by 8.1% last year, and expected to fall a further 3.8% this year. However, this is in line with the forecast issued by AIDA at the end of last year. And as we have seen, the air demand has fallen significantly in the first half, and is thus expected to be around the same level in the second half. Now, let me explain the demand forecast for major organizations and market players. First, freight waves predicted a uh, weak freight market in the second half, citing that global consumer demand is picking up more slowly than expected, and global smartphone shipments, a major air cargo item, were adjusted downwards, which will weaken relevant industry demand. And finally, as mentioned earlier in the ocean market outlook, the North American container import market is weak, which will also affect air cargo. Next, Zeneta, also forecasted weak demand in the second half, citing that shippers keep delaying plans for large-scale inventory replenishments in the second half, which lowers expectation for demand in the peak holiday season. And finally, DHL sees a potential for demand to recover later in the year, mainly in Asia, as the decline in the US and Europe markets is gradually slowing. However, they also mentioned that the market indicators for air freight are currently weak, hinting at a negative outlook. Let's move on to the supply and freight outlook for air cargo in the second half. First of all, supply is expected to expand continuously, mainly in the passenger aircraft belly capacity. As I mentioned earlier, the global supply of international passenger seats will likely continue to increase, which will affect the increase in belly supply related to cargo supply. And the table on the right is the airline's aircraft introduction status announced by IATA. 
the number of aircraft introductions, which decreased to 806 airplanes in 2020, will likely increase to 1,484 in 2023, which is a 20% rise from the previous year, and is also expected to increase by 6% from 2019, which will affect the increase in cargo supply. Finally, let me turn to the outlook of the air freight rates, which are expected to remain weak in the second half due to a supply and demand imbalance, based on the aforementioned factors. First of all, AIDA announced the 2023 global freight rate of $2.31 per kilogram in December of last year. And recently, they revised it downward by 7% to $2.14 in June, predicting a further decline in freight rates. Next, the table on the right shows a graph comparing TAC freight rates to the same period in 2019 before the pandemic. The freight rates that soared to as high as 378% from Hong Kong to the US in December 2021 have come down to 140% by June of this year. However, since the freight rates remained 40% above when compared to 2019, they are likely to decline further as weak demand continues. Also, the recent economic recovery centered around service rather than goods does not bode well for air cargo demand. On the supply side, since the supply of freighters and express couriers is still high compared to pre-pandemic levels, coupled with the increased supply of belly capacity, as previously mentioned, we expect excess air cargo capacity in the second half compared to pre-pandemic levels, which will further exacerbate the supply and demand imbalance. Finally, recent data from Zeneta indicates that shippers are demanding price renegotiations due to weaker demand, whereas logistics companies are struggling to secure volumes. This trend further lends weight to a bearish outlook for air freight rates. We introduced the freight rates forecast using our own internal AI engine called Samsung SDS Brightix. This time we again use Brightix to predict the future of the SCFI and TAC index. Since this forecast is based on historical data, these values could change depending on the variables we discussed. So let's take a look at it just as a reference. The ocean freight rates are expected to rise slightly in the second half compared to the first half due to increased demand and expectations for economic recovery. However, the increase is expected to be limited by the aforementioned factors of increased supply. The SCFI composite index began to recover gradually in June in July, as we expect it to be flat to slightly above 1,000 points in the second half. The index will be within $1,300 and $1,800 range for the U.S. West Coast and $2,700 to $3,000 range for the U.S. East Coast, and around $850 range for Northern Europe. For your reference, the key indicators for the ocean market in the Brightix model are not only the SCFI freight rates, but also includes other factors like demand, supply, schedule reliability, and others. For the TAC forecast, which is an air freight rate index, we utilize indicators like TAC index, IATA supply and demand, major countries manufacturing PMI indexes, and jet fuel and WTI oil data for prices. For the Hong Kong to North America route, the forecast is $3.80 to $3.90 in Q3, and $4 to $4.40 in Q4, with a slight rebound in Q4 after a decline from the current rate in Q3. For the Hong Kong to Europe route, we are forecasting $3.60 to $3.80 in Q3, and $3.50 to $3.60 in Q4, which is similar to current fares with no rebound. We have covered the economic and logistics market conditions and outlook, as well as some forecasts for the future. This is the end of our today's webinar. We will see you again next time with even better content and information. Thank you everyone for watching.